Hello. I wanted to do a video slash podcast slash update marking one year since I've been diagnosed with type 1 diabetes because it's something I feel like I've really struggled to speak about to people and there still feels like a lot of people in my life who don't even know that I have this or deal with it. I've kind of shared it in bits and I still haven't really come to terms with the full impact of the diagnosis and the story. Um, and I think it's important as part of the work I do to just do this video and just get it all out there and remember what the journey has been. And I think a large part of why I'm sharing it is because it does feel very connected to my mental health experience. This could be up for debate, but I very strongly personally feel that the trauma of mental health problems that I suffered through music college and through the early, my early 20s has manifested itself in this chronic illness. Um, and I think that's important to share because it's fine, I'm dealing with it, but it really has felt like coming out of that time of trauma. This is how my body is reacting and coping and this is the sort of physical manifestation and reminder almost of that happened. You know, that was a really difficult, traumatic time. So I'm going to split the video up into the diagnosis story, getting used to it, how the medical staff have treated me compared to how they treated me with a mental illness, work, music in general and concerts and things and then kind of going on to my mental health and like how I'm dealing with it now. So starting with the diagnosis story. So I would say I was experiencing symptoms about two months before I was diagnosed. So I think I was diagnosed the last day in February of 2023. So that must have been like what, like the 28th of February? Um, and I'd been experiencing the worst thrush imaginable for those two full months. Thrush everywhere, itching, burning. I, I, I would go into details, but I think you could probably just imagine it was unbearable and no amount of canniston was helping. Nothing was helping. It was so awful. I had, yeah, I just felt constant burning. And it's one of those things as a woman, I feel like you can kind of just deal with. And if you've had thrush before, you kind of just know it's going to go. But this really did not feel like it was going anywhere. Um, and alongside that, I started feeling extremely thirsty. And I kind of, towards the end, I sort of forgot what thirst felt like because it was so normal for me to feel this kind of insatiable thirst. And it's like, the kind of thirst down to your absolute core. And that's really hard to put into words, but it was like, oh. And it was kind of thirst, not necessarily for water, but for like milkshake and like fruit juice. And just like, and as soon as I'd have that, it was almost like a drug. Like I remember going out in sort of January and February, 2023. And just every time I would leave the house, I would be on the lookout for, it's almost like the first shop I went to, I had to buy some kind of like sweet drink to just tide me over. And that would probably only last an hour. So I got really into squash, really into juice. Like I just, I would chug it. And then obviously I'd be up all night pissing. Um, and alongside that, I had a really severe dry mouth. And I thought this could be, oh, is my medication maybe working too well or like is this to do with my mental health medication is this what's going on and it clearly was just a major thirst problem another symptom I had was severe cramping in my legs uh, at night that was weird <laughs> it wasn't all the time it was sort of here and there I would get these really weird cramps in my leg um, and then it would go another symptom was severe hunger and just eating and just sugar. I, I got really into baking, um, which I have, I guess I have been into baking, but it was like 
I need to make this food to eat. Like I made cinnamon buns. I, like my flatmates loved me. Like I was so in the mood for just sugar all the time. I remember the day before I was um, diagnosed, I'd gone to Aldi and bought that like sprinkle primary school cake and had that with custard. And it was almost like just sort of the last insane meal. And I remember them asking me like at the hospital, what have you eaten today? And I was literally just listing all of this sugar because that's all I wanted. But at the same time, I was definitely noticing there was no kind of weight gain associated with that, even though I was literally shoving it in. <laughs> um, and that was just, it would definitely just cross my mind as being something weird. Um, so I guess then these symptoms just didn't go away. Like I started kind of just dealing with it. I tried to make a doctor's appointment, but six weeks, I was waiting, I was waiting for that six weeks. And I think I was about week three when I went to A&E. Um, and I went to A&E because I had bought some of those urine test strips because I'd obviously Googled my symptoms being the anxious being that I am and it had come up with diabetes as one. So I bought these test strips and I can't really explain it, but the glucose was brown, which is like the, the high end of sugar. And then the, the ketones, which is another thing that's a problem with diabetes, high blood sugar, they were like right at the end. So I just sort of hopped in an Uber, went straight to hospital and, I entered the waiting room, I showed them the test strip, I put it inside like a Ziploc kind of bag. I showed the person on the front desk and she was like, yeah, okay, this looks pretty intense. And then I went and saw the like triage nurse and told him what I'd been dealing with. And he said, are these real symptoms or are these Googled symptoms? And I was like, no, like this is genuinely my been my experience. But obviously having had that fear of not being believed, I was so panicked. And he was like, because if this is real, if these are really what you're feeling, then I'm gonna fast track you. But if you're just wasting my time, he was like, I see a lot of people who claim to have the symptoms that you're claiming to have. And like, if you're wasting my time then. And I just remember being like so upset and just being like, I've made this up, I'm wasting everyone's time. I didn't, I wasn't sure that I was actually going to have any kind of outcome like even though I could see the results on this test strip I was still kind of like this is serious but probably also isn't like it's probably me being anxious or probably me overreacting um so then they took me into another room I once I'd convinced him that yes this was genuinely the experience took me into another room and tested my blood sugar and I remember it said 29 or 30 and obviously I just didn't know what that meant no one really reacted to that at all so they did that and then they tested the ketones and again it was like a number sort of I don't remember exactly what the number was but again I was just I just didn't know what any of it could mean so it just didn't alarm me and then they made me wait two hours I went back in and they said you've got type 1 diabetes almost certainly we're going to have to test your blood for antibodies but we're just going to have to admit you so they admitted to me and put me in um, intensive care, which was a very strange thing to do. Um, put me in intensive care, attached me to all of these like machines on the drips and like monitors and it was pretty fucking intense and yeah, very, very horrible. And then they moved me to another part of A&E. My brother came, looked after me and for the next few days it was just like, my mum came and looked after me as well and we were just being taken through how to test blood sugar, how to inject insulin. The nurses were doing it at first, I was on a drip, the insulin was coming in through a drip and then they were trying to wean me off that and take it with insulin pens, which I now live by, I've got them here. <laughs> um, so I had long acting, which is the green one and short acting, which is what you take with your food, which is the orange one. And yeah, this really nice nurse, diabetes nurse, kind of took me through it all. And oh my gosh, I don't really remember. I just remember being like, this is a really irritating, it feels like a really irritating course I've been forced on. Like, it feels like an option 
you know, for GCSE that I've been forced to do. Like it was kind of no more than that. It was just like an annoyance. And I think over the next few months, it really felt like it revved up in terms of how much it was impacting me. So then I came home and I remember the first few days of testing my blood sugar. I was having to do it with this finger prick thing and a monitor um, that you like put a test strip in and prick your finger. And that got really irritating very quickly because I just felt like I was guessing constantly. And they were sort of, they were, we sort of, I sort of had a flat rate of how many units I'd be injecting. It's really boring to go into, but often I would get it wrong and, and I was experiencing lows for the first time, which is when you accidentally take too much insulin and you have a low blood sugar. And it's a very scary experience. It feels a lot like a panic attack. Um, and I just, yeah. I found it really hard to experience lows because of that anxiety feeling. So I would then, for the first few months, I definitely erred on the side of just running my blood sugar high all the time because I was so scared. Um, and I don't know if that was the best idea, but I've definitely got more used to like, I think because my blood sugar was high for so long, I kind of didn't know how it might feel then to be in a normal range. And I think I found the feeling of the normal range very stressful. Um, but I'm now getting used to like what normal range feels like. And it's OK to feel not thirsty. <laughs> it's OK to feel like normal. It's, it's, it's a whole new experience physically um, and kind of hard to put into words. Because you can genuinely feel when your sh blood sugar is dropping. It's such a weird feeling. It literally feels like something is being like shoved downwards <laughs> inside. It's very bizarre. Um, so getting used to all those kind of sensations and also focusing on food, which I guess I'll come on to more in terms of mental health. Um, but after sort of two months with the finger pricking, I was moved on to this Libre sensor, which I now have. And I change every two weeks and that kind of goes to my phone and tells me what my blood sugar is. Um, and that's been really helpful um, just to kind of make me feel so independent and like I don't have to think about stopping to check it. I can just kind of go out and do my own thing, which was, I think, the biggest difficulty at first was just feeling like I was constantly having to think about it. And I just didn't want to. I'd never felt more forced into something against my will. And that was a really awful kind of life sentence feeling that I guess I don't really feel anymore but I felt it a lot in the first few months was just it felt very unfair it felt very like restrictive and especially after having had kind of eight years of very intense obsessive compulsive disorder I think it then felt like I'm being forced to obsess over something once uh, they've only just come out of you know eating problems and obsessive compulsive problems and now being forced to be confronted with all kind of numbers and stuff again it felt really very hard um yeah I think one of the biggest things was and still has been in terms of work I just haven't wanted to tell people about it it's felt it's been really interesting for me I think I've had a renewed understanding of how people might feel about mental health like I've never struggled too much with telling people about mental illness, but I think with this physical condition, I don't often want to tell anyone about it because they are naturally curious. Whereas with a mental illness, they're not usually as curious. So I think I just it's, a, it's an attention thing. I don't love talking about it. I would really rather it wasn't there. Um, and this was getting really bad to the point where I, if I went out for a meal with someone, which I do quite a lot for work, um, I just wouldn't inject. I just wouldn't tell them I wouldn't inject. I would go days and nights and running my blood sugar up to the 30s, just not wanting, like would rather risk my health than tell anyone about what I'm dealing with and having to stop to inject. And I couldn't even face the idea sometimes of like stopping the flow of a conversation to go and inject in the loo. Because I've often thought like, why didn't I just go to the loo and do it? But I think I felt so kind of consumed by the person I was with and that situation that it just didn't feel possible um but slowly I kind of just realized people aren't normally watching sometimes I'll do it without telling anyone and maybe they'll 
notice. Sometimes they're too kind of anxious to ask <laughs> or don't want to ask or I'll just tell them straight away and then we move on to the next topic of conversation. But I think the harder thing with that has been that I just don't have really any one in my life with it. So I haven't seen anyone navigate that experience of telling people and managing it out out and about day to day. Um, because now I feel very free with injecting in the street, anywhere, wherever I need to, I will do it. Like I'm not, I kind of see it like breastfeeding. Like I don't feel, feel like they should be, like they should have to do it in a private place. I don't really agree with that. If I need to, if, I, if I'm really high and I need to take it, I'll take it. Like, I'm a lot better at that now. I feel more empowered in it and just like, I'll just do it. Um, so that was hard. Um, and also kind of noticing s the stress impact of blood sugar and when work was really busy and difficult, watching it skyrocket and it feeling like no amount of insulin would change the number. Like I had that a lot in the beginning. I was very stressed at work. I had a really intense year last year with a lot of, with, you know, probably not enough, well, definitely not enough support within the team. Well, like the team was supportive, but like we didn't have enough people helping. So I think that really impacted my blood sugar to the point where I really did have to pare it all back and really concentrate on my health towards the end of last year because it was making me burn out and had so many impacts when your blood sugar's not normal like you are really ill and I think I'm noticing that more now when it's running high you're not well you're not feeling good you're feeling very exhausted and I would run high for days and days on end because I just couldn't see an end to this stress and I couldn't bring it down and it was hard so I guess stress is kind of similar but moving on to I guess the more mental health side of it so I'm going to be talking about food. I'm not necessarily going to be talking about numbers um, because I hate numbers. I hate talking about food numbers. Um, but I think it's important context just for a bit of the background of my own journey with eating. Um, so I have dealt with some eating disorders or disordered eating. Um, it was always kind of part of my OCD and a kind of coping mechanism alongside it. It was never a kind of thing in itself. I think it very rarely is a condition on its own. It's often intertwined with other things. And food was a major kind of, or lack of food or control over food has always been something that I've used from quite, I guess, throughout my teenage years. It's always been something I've used to feel better about myself or to have an element of control or to feel just like I'm on the right track to success it's really hard to explain but it just kind of you know the types of food and control of food always felt synonymous maybe with this goal of success um, and I think I'd spent the last three years before my diagnosis so the last four years really healing that innate sense of like food and how by eating problems kind of manifested themselves and I think this had then genuinely put me way back again because I learned that by not injecting I would purge my body I was essentially starving myself if I didn't inject insulin and learning that and learning about diabulimia which is a kind of eating disorder that only affects women, or people, sorry, with type 1 diabetes, um, I kind of realised, shit, this is something that could very quickly make me, you know, very much at risk. So I decided, after I was noticing a few months in, that I didn't want to inject, and maybe it was something to do with that whole rhetoric of food and um, body image I saw a therapist well I went back to the therapist that I'd been seeing um, for the last like eight years seven years and sort of talked through the diagnosis with her and about all my fears around weight gain and food and she was incredibly helpful because I was noticing with injecting insulin insulin is a growth hormone it makes you gain weight it just does it's a 
friggin just part of the hormone um and i think when you're in the beginning it's very normal for people to like gain a lot of weight and i don't know how noticeable it was but it felt very rapid and very intense to me um and wasn't something i wanted to sort of criticize myself for because I'd already put myself through so much stress. I just wanted to get used to the diagnosis and get things under control. Um, but I was noticing that like these eating disorder thoughts were kind of coming back. So I talked it all through with her. And another big fear that came up through talking with her and, and through these first few months was the fear of going to the hospital. And you have this sort of assessment every six months. And they take your weight and height and they've figured out they send it to you in a fucking letter, don't they, afterwards. So they would send me this letter with these numbers on and, and I would I just broke down. I couldn't cope with it. I didn't want to know. I felt so angry that I was being forced to see this information about my body that I just didn't want to see. And I just felt like I didn't want to hate myself anymore. I didn't want to hurt myself anymore. I was being forced to make this major choice in my life, the kind of almost the biggest example I've ever had of you going to choose health or you going to destruct. Um, and I just knew I couldn't take any more destruction. You know, I could have I could have destructed. It's always very possible with to abuse your body when you have a health condition like this. But I think I really was shown this very clear decision which is it going to be um and I think slowly I really chose and continue to choose health and life and can you know positive control over blood sugar um and I think that's been made a lot easier to choose that because I felt very taken very seriously by medical staff and this kind of relates to mental health because when I was dealing with OCD and when people were saying these words, anxiety disorder, depression, I was kind of given these words, but it was never a proper diagnosis. It was always kind of talked about and I was coming up with it on my own and sort of figuring it out for myself. And and then eventually, I guess I got a proper diagnosis, but it was so messy and it was so, un. people were so unbothered by it in the NHS, I mean that I just felt completely on my own dealing with this new experience. So when my OCD was really ramping up at age 18, I felt completely like I just had to deal with it myself, obviously with the help of my family, but like, what do they know? They're not being given support either. But with diabetes, it was like, this is a, what are these to say? I actually wrote it down because I was like, I couldn't believe they, they kept saying this, they kept saying we recognise this new diagnosis as a lot to come to terms with, but we're here for you. People were calling me up every few days to ask me how I was and to say, like, we're here for you with this new diagnosis. Like, it's a lot to get come to terms with. And I just remember feeling so pissed off because I was like, where were you when I was dealing with a new OCD diagnosis and feeling isolated and suicidal and it was kind of just expected that I would deal with it. And with diabetes, I remember I kept saying to people, like, this is a doddle in comparison to that. This is a doddle in comparison to managing a mental illness. I wish they would kind of see that. There's so much funding, there's so much understanding because of a blood sugar reading. It's like, what did I have to do with OCD to make people realise that it was a real issue? people were so scared of talking about it or of really uncovering it for what it was and I I just I can't really tell you the power in people being like this is a lot to come to terms with we're here for you like you can call us any time of day and I know there are hotlines for mental health and I know there are these kind of services but it feels very extreme it wasn't like a baseline treatment for everyone with a diagnosis of depression but you get this, whereas it is a baseline treatment for everyone with type 1 diabetes. So it was just very evident to me that this, that a medical condition, is a, is a privilege there. There's also a privilege in that I get my prescriptions for free now. 
I didn't used to get my antidepressant for free. You know, and now everything's free. Just because of this, just because of this autoimmune disorder. And I'm not saying just, like it's a big deal. It's a lot, it, there is a lot to deal with. Um, but I guess going on to sort of how I'm feeling about it now, I feel like my range is a lot better in general. I feel like I'm managing it a lot better. I'm noticing what helps and maybe what doesn't. With food, I'm finding it hard because I want to react and be very intuitive about what I want to eat. But when there's a level of like a metal thing going into your skin to correct, you often find yourself just being like, can I be bothered to eat carbohydrates right now? And I think that's a funny way around thinking about food and not something you kind of look at food and be like, I'd, you know, I'm just going to go for something that doesn't have anything in it, so like any carbs in it, so that I can just not think about an injection right now. Which is so interesting to me because, you know, it's like looking for low carb things, but not out of a sense of weight loss, but out of a sense of just can't be asked and don't want to just, because can't be bothered with changing meals and sorting it all out. So it's, a, it's an interesting one, um, but I'm finding foods that work for me. I'm finding more of a rhythm with that, feeling more accepting about my body and just how it's working and grateful that I'm not thirsty anymore. <laughs> grateful I don't have thirst anymore and just feeling more free and like I can live just more normally with it, um, whatever that means. But I guess... Going back to the the trauma element to why I feel like this happened at all, that's hard. You know, people when you know when I mention it to people, they often say like, "Have you read the Body Keeps the Score?" And I've dipped in and out of it. And I think if you've read that book, you'll probably understand why my first thought was, "This is this is trauma related. This is mental health related. This is stress related from all those years of." extreme sort of mental anguish um and for me it just validates that experience not validates it but it like it just reminds me of the intensity of that experience and that often our bodies are very sensitive to intensity in that way and I'm not saying that's for everyone but for me it just so clearly felt like the moment I reached healing mentally seemed to be the moment that my body gave out. <laughs> so weird, so, so interesting. Um, and it is a lifelong condition, that's what's weird. I think a lot of people don't realise that, a lot of people think that it's like type 2 and that it can be cured and it can't. Um, and that kind of chronic element to it is a struggle um but it's just not something i dwell on because honestly if you add up all the minutes of the day where diabetes is involved it's really not that much time um especially now i feel more in control of it and like i understand my body and how it works with it now um but i hope this has been kind of interesting do ask any questions you might have about the disorder. Is it a disorder? The autoimmune condition? Um, or about my experience with a diagnosis or whatever. I hope this hasn't scared anyone. Just be aware of um, those symptoms if you start experiencing them. Take them seriously. Be aware that often we will tolerate a lot more than we ever should. Um, and even if you are an anxious person and like me have dealt with hypochondriasis or any kind of health anxiety, I, I don't know. I feel like it's worth, it's definitely worth, yeah, checking, checking that things are okay and not assuming that it's you all in your head or that it's, you overreacting because it very well might not be 
Um, but thank you so much for listening and for being here. And I am so grateful that I feel able to share this on the platform and that I know I'm not alone in dealing with new diagnoses and chronic conditions. And if anyone else is, I really see you, feel you. Let's have a bit of a discussion if you want to. Um, it's a weird thing to wrap your head around and I know it's going to come in waxing and waning in terms of how not while I deal with it. Um, but yeah, I see you all. Thank you so much for listening and I look forward to seeing you again really, really soon.